Well, how do you identify a configuration of a machine? You need to know what state it's in. You need to know where the head is looking at. And you need to know what the tape looks like. Now, the tape is essentially finite here. There's only 100 cells. How many different sets of zeros and ones can I put in these 100 cells? Two, it's like how many binary numbers are there that have 100 digits? Two to the 100th. This represents the different tape configurations. That's not all. For each of those, I could be in any one of these three states. Times three. And for each of those three states and for each of these configurations, my head could be in how many different places? A hundred, right? It could be in front of the first one, in front of the second one, in front of the third one, all the way up to in front of the hundredth. I'm going to rewrite this in general. Q is the number of states. K is the number of symbols on the tape. S of n is how much space I have. And this is the number of configurations in a machine with Q states, K symbols, and S of n space. Here's the specific example. Here's the general way of looking at it. Here's the point. When you start running this machine as a deterministic algorithm, you just run it. But on a separate tape, you go ahead and look at the number of states, look at the number of symbols, look at the alleged space function, calculate that on the size of the input. So you calculate this 100 and this 3 and this 2. And then you calculate this number. And then as you simulate the machine, you start counting one step. Two step, three step, four step. If during the simulation you ever accept or reject, then you accept or reject. You're all done. And that's a fine simulation. But what happens, the only problem is, what if the machine keeps running and running and running and running? And sooner or later, it takes more than this many steps. At that point, you know that two configurations that are identical have occurred during this computation. If that happens, it means you did something like this. Configuration, 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 dot, dot, dot. Two million later, configuration, there. Once this happens, you are stuck in a loop that will go forever. If you didn't accept up till here, you're not going to accept if you continue. Because whatever happened from here down is going to happen again when you get back there. The machine looks exactly the way it did when you were here. If you turned it off here, and you went down this loop and turned it off again, and you asked the person what's the difference, they would not be able to ch tell any difference in the machine. It looks the same. So it's in an infinite loop. The point is, if you have a space bound on your Turing machine, you can tell if it's in an infinite loop by counting enough steps. When it's past the number of configurations in the machine, you know there's an infinite loop. OK. Are there questions about that idea? That's a fundamental idea. That bounding the space lets you bound the time also. And that's why exponential time contains polynomial space. Here's the exponential time. This much time to simulate S of n space. An input size of <coughs> on an input size of n, right. On input length n, right. Space tm on input n. All right. Questions about this? Stuff tricky, huh? So this picture is now justified. It really does have that hierarchy and that structure. Teresa, you have a question? Yeah. What are you thinking about? OK. Gary, OK? Yeah. Yeah, all right. Good. In this kind of world, we don't care at all if the time is in any way. I mean, 2 to the 100 is obviously not a reasonable time. Um, <laughs> but we don't care. If, there, if it would end before eternity. That's right. Good well, to, this is right. Well, it's exponential time, right? <laughs> There's super exponential time too. It's not that. It's not two to the two to the something. 
You're thinking this is weird? There's a problem that you can prove. It's one of the few problems you can prove actually requires exponential time. There's a problem that you can prove actually requires exponential time. It's not exponential time complete, you know, where if it's solvable, then everything else is solvable. It's even stronger than that. It really needs exponential time. And it's not some whacked out weird problem. It's take two regular expressions where you're allowed to do this. You know, instead of just 0 star and 0 plus 1 or something, you're allowed to like, uh, put in stuff like this, zero, you know, 1 to the 10th. You're allowed to use exponentiation, just like in your regular expressions you use in any language, where they probably let you do just that. Two regular expressions that let you do that, are they the same, yes or no, has to use exponential time. So don't start writing algorithms to do that. Regular expressions are hard to compare. Do they generate the same language? Very, very hard. That's way out here. So yeah, I mean, it's not practical, but that problem is one that, that a naive student is going to try to do one day. You know, and it's nice to know that better come up with a better way to do it. Other questions about this? This little bullseye thing goes down two levels also. And our book talks about these levels, and I'll put them in for completeness. So one here and one here. This is non-deterministic log space, and this is deterministic log space. The book calls these NL and DL. This means you have a non-deterministic machine that uses logarithm space. And this means you have a deterministic machine that uses logarithm space. We just showed that exponential time contains polynomial space for the same reason, for the exact same reason, no difference in the argument, <coughs> polynomial time contains deterministic log space. Just take this logarithm space and raise it to a power of 2, and you get a polynomial. 2 to the log n is... is you know, linear. So polynomial time does contain deterministic log space. Non-deterministic log space is in between. People like to know how these classes really relate. I wrote it in this way because these are containments. But are any of these really proper? Maybe these are all the same. There's only one level that anybody really knows today is proper. People know that there are things down in here I'll circle this little circle area. Things in here that cannot be done out here. So there is really a difference between this level and that level. There is a hierarchy. There are things that take polynomial space, and you can't do them in logarithm space. And we can prove that. It's not a hard proof. There's a hierarchy that breaks up this from this. But nobody knows if p and np are the same. Nobody knows if p space and np are the same. Nobody knows if p space and p are the same. Nobody knows any of those things. People do know that exponential time and polynomial time are not the same. OK, so there is another hierarchy. There's a little barrier between here and way out there. Right, so there's a few things we know about proper containments, but a lot of things we don't know. When we don't know, then we invent this idea of a complete problem. And I want to remind you what that is. You've seen it before a number of times, but I just need to remind you. A problem is complete in a particular ring of the bullseye when every other problem in that ring reduces to it. So for example, this little problem here, that x, is NP complete. Two conditions. A, all problems in NP reduce to it. And B is kind of a simple condition. Itself is an NP. That makes a problem NP complete. In some sense, it's the hardest problem. If everything reduces to it, everything reduces to this problem, 